Welcome to the service here today. Um, friends, will you join me in prayer? Great God, we thank you for today. We um, come before you eager to worship you, to remind ourselves uh, where we are and where you are. You are above us. You are our God and our king and our joy and the reason for every breath we take. And so we thank you, God, for this day, for this hour, for this time together with friends. We pray for those who can't be here today and, re and remember them and trust, God, that you know their prayers and their hearts as well. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 574 in the book. The words will be on the screen. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. 
No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let us unite our hearts, let us pray. Gracious God, you have said to us in your word that we should ask and it would be given, we should seek and we would find, we should knock and the door would be opened. And so we come here in prayer, knocking, knocking at the door of prayer, at the door of uncertainty, at the door of need. We're not always sure what to expect, for you speak to us in different ways at different times and different voices. So teach us to wait at the door, teach us to stand at the door in hope, hoping it will be opened, to be ready for the answer no matter how long we wait, and teach us to recognize the light of clarity of new possibilities of answers, and to see the worth of our efforts, the range of our hopes, and the meaning of our deeds. And teach us, too, that the world is not ours for us to conquer, but yours for us to tend. Convince us that we are not to retreat from the world, but return to it, filled with your compassion. And empower us to do this, O Lord. And as we commit ourselves again to you in this place at this hour, remind us that our commitment is meaningless if we do not exercise it in other places. And as we dedicate ourselves to you again in this hour, remind us that our dedication is unacceptable if we do not express it in other hours. So let your will be our will, your kingdom, our kingdom on earth, as it is in heaven. And speak, O God. Whisper into the broken places of life your grace and truth. Shine forth in the darkest corner your light of new life. Proclaim boldly the year of your own jubilee that captives might be freed, sight regained, and greed ended. Proclaim now the full release to faith and hope and joy and peace. 
Proclaim now the reign of your kingdom. Shall it come in us and among us and around us now always and forever. And hear us now as we ask in one voice the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue in our worship as we bring to the Lord our offerings and gifts. Well, this will be the concluding message in a series we've been doing this fall on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' uh, best-known teaching. I've been able to go through chapter 5 and chapter 6 of Matthew. We're not having time to do chapter 7. Maybe that'll come next year. haven't quite determined that yet. But next week, we move into the Advent series on uh, Blessed to be a Blessing. We want to welcome those on Niagara Worship Online who have been with us this month, and uh, thank you for joining us at our services. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> I'll apologize for my raspy voice again. You can probably expect this almost every week. As a matter of fact, I had a phone call this week from a 
a woman about a funeral that she'd asked me to attend to. And she said, well, you married us 19 years ago. I said, well, that's, that's good. I, I can't really remember what I did 19 years ago very much. And she said, I remember your voice. This is over the phone from 19 years. So uh, some of you have go, grown used to it by now, I'm sure, as well. I want to show you a picture. Start. Jack Johnson, Columbus Blue Jackets. And we read the sports section Friday in the review. Morris did, some of you did. Uh, and Toronto Star as well. Jack Johnson signed a contract in 2005. He entered the NHL. He was the third round draft pick for the Carolina Hurricanes. And in 2011, he signed a multi million dollar contract with the Columbus Blue Jackets, the team he plays for now. In his nine-year NHL career, he's made about $20 million to this uh, point in time. Now, he's been taken to court for uh, overdue bills and things like that. His assets now are about 50000 a little under that, from $20 million over nine years. He got some bad financial advice from essentially his mother and his father. His mother took $15 million out in his name at some very exorbitant interest rates. Almost every nickel he makes now for the Blue Jackets is uh, taken back by his, uh, her, her creditors, his creditors. So uh, Review reported that he's not even speaking to his parents. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> Investments are a tricky thing. You've got to make investments that count, and that's what we're going to talk about, but not so much financial as you'll see. And if you were to turn on a television, listen to it for any length of time, there's going to be some commercials, advertisements, urging you to invest with this organization or that organization. I'm about to show you a 30-second clip, but I've got to set this up. It's the in bank, and maybe you've seen some of the commercials where people are walking around holding a number. That's going to be the clip. Just for the record, I have my own financial planner. I'm not recommending the in bank. I've got nothing to do with those guys. I'm only showing a clip for the point it makes. Okay, so let's uh, let's watch it. You spend your working life taking care of your number. Retire, and it can take care of you. With help from ING, you can use your number to get steady income in retirement. Do you know your number? Learn more at ingyournumber.com. ING, your future made easier. Okay, I'm not recommending, I just, the point is, what's your number? What's your number? Do you have a number that is your number for security, your number for your future? How much do we think we need to have a safe and secure future? And if you analyze many, many people in North America, the answer is always more, more. And an investment strategy essentially is to get as much as you can, as quick as you can, wherever you can. And that's what got Jack Johnson into so much uh, trouble. So maybe we should consider a new investment strategy. And we've been talking our way through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we've been talking about the things he talked about, relationships, worry, prayer, loving our enemies, all of those things, violence. But if you look at all of the things that Jesus talked about, and some people have added the verses, I never have, I just take their word for it, that Jesus said more about money than about faith, he said more about money than about love than almost everything he, he talked about. And I think one of the reasons 
was Jesus understood the destructive power that money can have, both for those who have too much or too little, either way. So we're going to look this morning at what Jesus had to say about how to invest. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. We're doing a series that's closing off this week called Making Sense of the Bible. And one of the things that uh, the author Adam Hamilton has said is that to understand a lot of the biblical material, you have to know the culture, the context in which it was spoken. And so when Jesus talks about moth and rust and thieves, he's using some examples that would be very obvious to people in first century Judea. So for example, do not store up treasures where where moths come. Why would he say that? Well, in Jesus' neighborhood, an individual's position in society was very much attributed to the clothing that they wear. You're familiar with the expression, clothes make the man? Some of us are old enough to have heard that, not said much anymore, but the old adage has its point. And so in Jesus' day, that was very much the case. The thing is, of course, if moths get into all of that finery, what happens to it? What happens to it? There goes your uh, status. There's nothing permanent about clothing. What about rust? What does rust do? Well, you know what it does with a car? It eats away at the metal in the car. Or Jesus' reference could have easily been to worms or rats or mice, the little vermin that uh, eat up the storages of grain or corn in the barns, the little critters who do that. Nothing permanent about that kind of treasure either. And then there's the matter of thieves, moth, rust, and thieves. That's what he said. Well, Jesus' day and age, there was no ING bank. There was no investors group, nothing like that at all. People literally kept their gold and silver in a sack. They would hide it somewhere under the mattress, maybe. Some of them buried it out in a field. Jesus told a parable about a farmer that's out digging, and he comes across somebody else's buried treasure. That was the way he did that. And so you could go to sleep at night with a little nest egg and wake up in the morning and a thief had taken it and it would be gone. Nothing permanent about that. So Jesus' message essentially is this. Don't put too much store in things that aren't going to be yours forever anyway. If clothes are a big deal to you, well, that's fine. But be aware they're not going to last. If accumulated possessions, the fruit of your labor, is important, well, that's okay. But just be aware that all kinds of things can deprive you of that. If having a lot of money is all, it means a lot, well, that's all right too. But remember, nothing guarantees that you'll keep it forever. As a matter of fact, the only guarantee you get is that there come a day when None of that will be ours. You heard the old Spanish proverb, there's no pockets on a shroud. As a matter of fact, uh, Nelson Taylor, a retired funeral director, talked to me after the first service, and he said, I can verify that because I've done a lot of funerals, and I've checked, and nobody brought any money in with them. A rich man in the town died one day. Two men were talking about it. And one of them said, how much did he leave? The other said, all of it. So what does this mean? It means that treasures on earth are investments that are temporary. They're impermanent. Vulnerable to decay or theft. 
or destruction, that stuff doesn't last. And even the most powerful, wealthiest can't make the stuff last. A few years ago, one of the wealthiest Jewish philanthropists in the world died. He left behind one billion dollars, billion dollars. He left two wills, one to be opened immediately, the other to be opened 30 days after his burial. So, among the instructions on the first will was a request that he be buried in a certain pair of socks. Sounded a bit strange, but the family made it anyway. The rabbi said no. They went to a, a Jewish uh, tribunal, but it violated some specific Jewish burial customs. So the decision was upheld, no socks. 30 days pass, second will is open, and it reads something like this. My dear children, by now you must have buried me without my socks. I want you to truly understand that a man can have one billion dollars, but in the end, he can't even take along one pair of socks. At the end of our lives, a billion dollars will be no more worth than a pair of socks, no matter how much stuff we accumulate, whether it's wealth or fame or accolades that we might achieve, they don't last. We can't take it with us. And when we place our trust in things that are impermanent, we measure our success, our worth, we'll be doing it relative to the people around us. How much does my brother have or my neighbor have? Or what house or car are they affording? What social circles do they run in? And that, for us, creates a certain anxiety. We live in anxiety based on the stuff. Not because the things last or provide peace or real security, but our lives start boiling down to that number that we carry around. What do we need to have a good life and a secure future? What's your number? What about all the stuff we accumulate? I think I've said our daughter moved out to uh, Regina about a month ago, started a new job out there. So before Sarah went, I had some of her stuff stored above our garage. So I go up, check it out. She needs some of it. I'm looking at some other stuff that I've accumulated. And there is a set of golf clubs. I already have one in the, well, it's not in the trunk of the car anymore, but it's in the garage. Why do I need that sec? Why am I holding on to that? I'm never going to hit one of those clubs again. I get a box of books. 30 years old, I'm thinking, well, when I retire, I'm going to read them all. There's small print 30 years ago. I won't be able to see them. And, uh, and I'm not making this up. There's a, a box full of slacks, size 34, waiting for me to fit them again. <laughs> what are the chances? Why do I keep all this stuff? You should have heard Barb at the earlier service. She's been after me for years to get rid of it. But we, we mean, we just, we do that. We do that. You know, there's a place when I'm talking about the number. What's your number? There's a place where people are known by their number. Some of you are getting it. Where are people known by their number? Prison. And if we keep accumulating stuff, it imprisons us. And Jesus, to really underline what he says, to put some punch to it, says at the conclusion of, of this part of his talk, you can't serve both God and money. 
He doesn't say money is evil or that you shouldn't use it wisely or provide for your families. Of course that's true. Of course that's true. It simply says you can't place all of your trust in security in something that's impermanent. You've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice at some point in your life. Now, Bob Dylan, great songwriter, has written a song a few years back about this. Uh, a couple of the lines go like this. He's saying, you may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. You may be a construction worker working on a home. You may be living in a mansion. You might live in a dome. You may own guns, and you may even own tanks. You may be somebody's landlord. You may even own banks. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Convicting stuff from Mr. Dillon, isn't it? And that goes to our assumption that the best chance of a good life is to get as much as we can, as fast as we can, while we can. How did that work for Jack Johnson? Not so good. It's a lie that our culture has given to us, that we're only as good as our number. And what a tragedy if we all define our human worth based on a bank account. But the good news, the good news, is that Jesus knows we're worth more than any number. We were made for what he calls treasures in heaven. These are the treasures that last, that count, that no moth or rust or thief can destroy. And they're not just the gold crowns, to use one of the old gospel songs that you get in the afterlife because you were a nice person here. There are some real investments that we can make and experience in life today if we take Jesus seriously. So I'm gonna, last week I gave you a seven points about prayer. Today I'm going to give you four about investments, about our priorities. It's good to have a concrete list of things in hand. So here's the four to get started. Storing up treasures in heaven means investing in your life with God. God has treasures that he seeks as well, and I'm one of them, and you're one of them. Jesus, in one of his other teachings, said that we are worth more than many sparrows. God's greatest treasure is you and is me. You know that most familiar Bible verse, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. Well, I've heard a number of commentators say to really get a grip on that, to understand it a little more clearly. Instead of talking about the world, which is a big thing, you need to narrow that down and put your own name in that. God so loves John that he gave his only son that if John believes in him, John will have eternal life, and you can translate your own name into there. And Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly in John's gospel. But there's all these pressures and anxieties and worries that make it easy to let our relationship with God be the last thing of the day that we think of. We're busy, we're tired, we're hurried, we're stressed. And that's why it's important to have a daily time where we can listen Maybe music, maybe prayer, silence, solitude, scripture, but some way of staying in touch with God. So, you want to have treasures in heaven? Invest some time each day in your relationship with God. Storing treasures in heaven means also prioritizing your human relationships. We're called to build and invest in our relationships with people, family and friend alike. Now, yes, we're to be good stewards of what we have, to provide for people we love. But if we never make time, then 
What does that leave us? We're to invest in relationships, friends, and family. This is true whether you have a partner, whether you're single, whether you're young or you're old. It doesn't really matter. It's true for us all. Relationships are to be important. Remember I went up uh, stairs. I'm just going to get some water here. Above the garage, found some golf clubs and slacks. Well, that was because our daughter was moving to Regina, as I said. And so, Barb and I thought that after, because she, she was out there for a couple weeks already after Christmas, I'd uh, head out there. And she said, well, you should check the uh, aeroplan thing, because we have this card that we get aeroplan miles on. I hadn't never looked at it. I never thought we were using it. We never did use it intentionally. So I'd call up the uh, aeroplan people and say, you know, I... How many miles do I have? I'd like to go to Regina. She says, well, you've got enough to get to Winnipeg. And for 30 bucks more, we'll send you to Regina. I said, done. And since then, we've started using uh, that much more intentionally. Doing it for groceries and things like that where we hadn't used Visa for that before. Why are we doing that? Not to pile miles up, well, that's partly, but the reason is for a relationship, a relationship. Storing up treasures in heaven means prioritizing your relationship with God, with family and friends as well. Third thing, storing up treasures in heaven means serving where there's a need. Investing your life in somebody else. We talked about this at the start of September. We did a special Sunday where we had a volunteer appreciation. There still are some booklets at the back. I saw them earlier this morning, listing the various ways within this congregation that you can serve. And so if anybody, there are books back there. I invite you to pick one up if you haven't seen it yet. And think about ways here or wherever God might lead you. But investing also where there is a need for others. The early church did that. One of the most important tasks those first Christians felt was the care of those who couldn't care for themselves. There's a story from those days in the early church. It was a time of terrible persecution. The Roman Empire uh, and authorities, they broke into this church to loot whatever treasures they might find. They demanded of the deacon in charge that he hand over everything of value. The deacon simply pointed to the widows and orphans who were being fed, to the sick who were being nursed back to health, to the poor whose needs were being supplied. And he said, there, sir, those are the treasures of the church. We heard earlier this morning, there's some white envelopes in the, uh, in the pews there for uh, the Christmas vouchers that we'll be sharing with a variety of people. That's just one of the ways of helping where there's a need. And fourth thing, storing up treasures in heaven, of course, means giving regularly to God's work as a spiritual discipline. Uh, part of what we do to stay close to God. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if I trust God with my checkbook, that means that I'm going to trust him with my life. It doesn't mean that we follow Jesus and shouldn't save money. Of course not. Jesus himself told a parable about a good Samaritan who was uh, going along this road. And when he saw a man who was beaten, he had some resources that he could help the guy with and pay the innkeeper to look after him. But what Jesus is saying is that our lives are more than a number. We're made for more than that. We're made to build a portfolio of real lasting treasures. Treasures not subject to rust or moth or decay. Treasures that are greater than fame or fortune. You know, I found when I climbed the attic in October, a whole lot of stuff I don't really need. Why am I holding on to that? I don't know. Some stuff we need to let go. And 
as a church, that's true as an individual, but it's also true as a church, as an alternative community. If we're committed every day, not just to get as much as we can as fast as we can, but to live a life that really counts for something and for someone. You may be familiar with a man named Robert Fulgham. Am I recognize that name? Minister, author, became well uh, known after writing a book called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. That's what put him on the map. Well, he had those professional careers, author, minister. It's amazing what you can find out on Wikipedia. He also worked as a ditch digger, a newspaper carrier, a ranch hand, a salesman for IBM, and a singing cowboy. He grew up in Waco, Texas. Well, late 90s, he gave an interview with a Christian humor magazine called The Door, and Fulgham reported that he had a lot of success, worldly success. People were always saying to him, well, you must have a big house and a big car, and he responds, no, I have the same house, same car, same friends, same wife. Fogum said he's on guard against all kinds of greed. And he's committing to serving God, not money. Now, he acknowledged fame was a challenge. And he said the challenge is to be a good steward with this kind of authority and power, especially with economics. So one year, late 90s, he did a book tour. And he used it to raise 670000 for some good causes. He said, I don't think I should be given extra credit for doing that. I think you should think ill of me if I didn't. And death does not scare Robert Fulgham. In fact, he's already picked out his grave, and he likes to go and visit it. It reminds him, he said, to live life in a way that's rich toward God. And when he sees his grave, he says to himself, don't get lost there. Just know where you're going. Good for Robert. Good for Robert. I want to close with uh, some words. I'm going to put them up on the screen of one of my favorite uh, preachers, Tom Long. To come to the end of the day or the end of a life with the satisfaction of having stood for what is good, with the joy of having been loved and loved well in return, with the memory of having shown mercy and the peace of having walked with God, those are the true treasures, the treasures of the kingdom of fortune no thief can plunder. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift that you've given to us in your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We thank you for his teaching that inspires and also challenges and help us day by day to live in this culture as his servants and as his followers. Amen. Our concluding hymn, number 586, words on the screen, we shall go out with songs of resurrection.
I'm going to be going to the main entrance to greet uh, those of you who need to be moving on. Angelo will be coming to the microphone here, and he will uh, conduct our congregational meeting. Now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence and peace of his Holy Spirit be with you and rest with you this day and always. Thank you.